We've all been there once. So, you want to be adventure smart. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, but what is being adventure smart? Being adventure smart is really all about taking responsibility for your own safety and following the three T's. <laughs> Got it. Um, what are the three T's? What are the three T's? The three T's are the trifecta of outdoor safety, trip planning, training, and taking the essentials. The three T's can vary from person to person, activity to activity, and season to season. But here are some important ways to ensure you are prepared and safe on your next adventure. Trip planning. We could go on forever about this one. Trip planning is an essential step and one of the easiest ways we can stay safe on our adventures. This is something that should be done every time we head into the outdoors, whether for a few hours or multiple days. Trip planning can be broken down into four simple steps. Planning your travel route and navigation is about picking a trail or route based on its difficulty that's relative to your experience, ability, and the amount of time you have. Know your limits. Not all trails are created equal, so know the terrain and conditions. A 10 kilometer hike scrambling straight up a steep mountain is a lot different than a 10 kilometer stroll around a lake. Before you go anywhere, check the weather and keep checking it as things can change fast. This includes wind, precipitation, temperature, and sunset times. Finally, make sure you leave a comprehensive trip plan with a trusted contact. Keep in mind, this may not be your mom or dad or best buddy. Choose someone you can count on if you were to get into trouble. A comprehensive trip plan might be as simple as sending your trusted contact a text or email with key information about your activity or using the Adventure Smart app, which allows you to enter a detailed trip plan. Training doesn't mean being an elite athlete or being queen of the mountain on Strava. Training is a continuous process of outdoor recreation. It's about developing the necessary skills and abilities to be safe. This might include working your way up to that big summit hike, taking a few courses to expand your wilderness and backcountry knowledge, navigation and route finding courses, or even learning more advanced skills like rescue and emergency training. You have planned and trained. Now make sure you take the essentials. Taking the essentials means packing everything you potentially need to stay warm, safe, and dry if an emergency unexpectedly arises. What if you rolled your ankle or got hurt? What if you got lost and had to spend the night outdoors? Take the time and be prepared to look after yourself. So that's it. Those are the three T's. That's it. <laughs> But no matter how hard you train, how well you trip plan, and how much essential gear you bring, you may still find yourself in an emergency. And that's okay. The wilderness can be unpredictable. If you find yourself in an emergency, it's important to stop, think, observe, and plan. Use that essential gear you brought to stay warm, dry, and safe, and contact 911 on your emergency communication device. Remember, search and rescue in BC is free for everyone. Remember, safety is an outcome of good trip planning, training, and taking the essentials. It's your responsibility. So let's all do our part and be adventure smart. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. I'm Scott Montague from Coquitlam Search and Rescue, and I'm going to be taking care of navigation through Zoom and Facebook Live tonight. Your cameras and mics are off for this session, but we still want to hear from you. If you, you, your question is lighting up your world, just throw it in the Q&A box and we'll keep track of them and we'll either answer live or online. If you don't want the audience to see your name, you can slap on some sun protection by making that question anonymous. I'll also be keeping an eye on the chat box and posting links in there as we go. I also encourage you to use the reactions button throughout the webinar. In fact, Let's give it a spin right now. If you've ever packed something just in case, 
but then ended up having to use it, give me a thumbs up. It was just in case, but you ended up, oh, that's a fair bit of people. Interesting. Also want to let you know if you stick around to the end, there's a chance to win a giveaway from our sponsors, Heli Hansen, which is giving away a backpack, and Bright Source, which is giving away a lamp. And no matter what, everyone's going to get a freebie from our sponsor, Fat Map. To get us started, I'd like to welcome the essential woman for SAR protection in the province, the executive director of Adventure Smart in British Columbia, Sandra Riches. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Scott, for that handover. It's so great to be here. We're in the thick of our summer series, which we've had seven webinars to date. Um, in total, we will, pardon me. This is the second last one, so we're really glad that you're here tonight. And this is a this is a hot topic. This is one that we talk about on a regular basis. And we're really glad you're here to experience all the insights and practicalities of our guests, which we'll, we'll get to in, a, in a, just a couple seconds here. I work closely with a team of five others at the BC Search and Rescue Association, um, from PR and communications to data management and myself for the director here of BC Adventure Smart. And, and we wanted to queue up and, and ask a few questions earlier today on our BC Adventure Smart Instagram. And, and there were some questions about the essentials. You know, are you carrying these items? Are you, uh, are, are you carrying them or do you think you should and maybe you will in the future? Uh, this gives, gives you a good idea to kind of quiz yourself of, of what you're packing, what you're not packing, what you should be packing. And, and we just had a little impromptu little quiz and it was quite interesting. I found as I watched it throughout the day and right before we kicked off this evening, I went in to double check the answers and noticed some, most of the answers were yes. Uh, some percentages were no and I should. The one that really grabbed my attention though was as it pans through here, thanks Scott for sharing, was the one about map. And about 51% said yes, they actually carry a map and 49% said no. That one caught my eye for the main reason is that uh, we have the top three reasons for search and rescue in British Columbia. The first one's injury. The second one's getting lost and disoriented. So it's really quite interesting. Uh, it makes me think, how do I reach these people that aren't carrying a map? What's, what's making them uh, not to think about that, not carrying it? Do they know? Are they unaware that that should be carried? That's what the discussions are all about tonight. You know, are people still unaware of the importance of bringing the essentials? The short answer is yes. Uh, a quick few stats and then I'll introduce my, my guests here. For example, a map and a headlamp are essential. In 2022, 183 search and rescue emergencies were to help people who did not have or did not know how to use a map to navigate and they became lost. And 12 emergencies were for people who did not have a headlamp and could not find their way home when it became dark. These are simple things to reduce a task and or the severity. So lots to think about this evening. So I'll just introduce our first guest and we'll kick right off here. Uh, Yelena, Yelena Birchich is a associate professor university at the Fraser Valley. Um, she obtained her PhD in social and personality psychology at UBC and completed her postdoctoral work at the Rotman School of Management, University of Toronto. She currently works at the School of Business at the University of Fraser Valley. She studies teens in space and other extreme environments. She's a mother, a traveler, and is uh, dog obsessed, so she says, which is okay with our team here tonight. Welcome and thank you. We're really looking forward to everything that you both have to share tonight, but um, we'll start off with you, uh, Yelena, and, and we look forward to the questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, let me just start my slides and then we can go from there. Um, I thank you for the introduction and I'm really excited to be here tonight. And so I want to center myself where I come from. So Sandra did talk about my, you know, I'm a researcher. I am not uh, a local search and rescue member. I am not, I do not climb these fabulous peaks around us. There's a couple of my friends in this webinar who know that um, I moan and complain a lot when I'm told to go uphill. Um, so I do research, I'm a researcher, and the research I do is with teams in extreme environments. So I look at team resilience, I look at 
um, team coping. I look how individuals deal with going to space. So one of the studies I was a part of was looking at how culture forms at the International Space Station. So, you know, do these individuals that go off so far away from Earth and so into an environment that's so unknown to us, um, do they form their own culture? Do they experience stress? And, you know, surprisingly, lots of these individuals aren't as stressed as we think they're going to be because they train and they prepare. So once I've done some stuff in space, which I'm still doing, um, we go down to Earth and to the Canadian Arctic. And I've been working with teams at um, in Eureka Weather Station, which is so up north on the map. Like if you went to Google Maps and you kept on going north, 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 and you were like, you can't possibly go more north. Well, you go some further north and that's where Eureka is. And there we're looking at very similar things from the Canadian Space Agency. And here we're focusing on that team resilience and team efficiency. And so last year I started chatting with BC Thar and saying, hey, you know, I know you're not in space. I know you're not up in the Canadian Arctic, but you know, you do put your members into extreme environments. And I started working with BC Thar. They still haven't seen any of the data yet. It's coming soon, I promise. Um, I started working with them, looking at, you know, how meaningful are these experiences that you that you do go on to the calls and the volunteer experience. We're also looking at this team resilience and coping and what do you value in these environments? So that's where my perspective for the essentials is coming from. It's coming from the research that I have done and the research I'm doing. And I understand how much training and preparation it requires for all of these individuals going into all of these environments to get into. So if you know your search and rescue member requires hundreds of hours of training, I think it's silly for us to think that it doesn't require any preparation for us to go into these environments. And so I am new to the search and rescue world, and I have been looking at some of the data out there, I've been looking at what the research has been done, and everything I come across, anecdotal evidence says, yes, essentials are essential. We should bring the essentials that the experts are telling us to bring. And Jay will tell you way more about that than I can, because I am not going to be out there calling you. Um, common sense also says, yes, essentials are essential. We should bring them. And, you know, I have two small kids and I never plan for my children to both fall in the mud and roll in dog poop um, on the same day. But I bring all the extra clothes so I'm prepared in case they do such silly things. Um, nobody plans to fall off, fall down a trail and break a leg. Nobody plans for that. But if you're prepared to do that, then prepared to deal with it, then that's common sense, right? Like it's there, just like my extra clothes for my child, extra clothes are top of the mountain in case you have to spend the night is common sense to me. Um, that's all fine and dandy, but I'm a researcher at heart, right? Like I do research, this is why I'm here as a scientist. So what does the data tell us? What, what's, what's out there, what's available? So let me kind of give you a very quick, like a, a snapshot of what's currently available when we look at the essentials. So a lot of the work has focused on identifying who doesn't pack the essentials and how should we target that training and research to convince those people not packing the essentials to bring the essentials. And there's a lot of work across many different countries and many different regions looking at this. A lot of it is in the US. Um, BCSR and Adventure Smart also has some of that data. I, I don't know if it's been published anywhere, but I have seen some of it and a lot of people, you know, don't bring the map. So who doesn't bring the map? And Sandra's been talking about it. Who are these people that we need to reach to tell them you need to bring a map? Who are the people um, that we need to reach to say, hey, it's 911 you call, not your best friend, right? And so that's kind of a whole body of research has looked at that. And that body of research tells us that one of the most cited reasons for not bringing the essentials um, are people who go on short trips. They assume short trips are less risky. Who cares? It's only, it's it's usually actually trips under 12 hours that people say, nah, it's a day trip, it doesn't matter. I don't I don't need to bring any of my stuff. It's, it's close by, people can come get me or I can just crawl my way out if necessary. Silly. Um, another, you know, line of research, another thing that people have found in these kind of who should we train, who should we reach is that those who are more, uh, most often underprepared tend to be younger, less fit and inexperienced. And actually the experienced hikers are open to learn more. They're open to um, build libraries to share resources. Um, you know, to, you know, they have two libraries where there's this idea of building a, a essentials library. So you can borrow some of the gear for certain places you go to. 
And then there's also this body of evidence, uh, research that looks at, you know, what kind of injuries were out there that we had to go out. And, you know, BC SAR has a paper out on the types of injuries that are require SAR attention. Sadly, there's also a line of research that looks at post-mortem. So people who have died, if, you know, looking in the past, looking in the last 10 to 15 years, um, people who have died on a recovery, who have, you know, a recovery call has been sent out. Um, there is evidence that equipment shortages after, um, often are the triggering factor of hiking death. And so there's this one study in Switzerland. They looked at the last eight years of um, SAR calls that led to a death in the Alps. And what they found was that about, um, I think 80% of the people didn't have proper clothing, so potentially died from hyperthermia, and 78% of the people didn't wear proper footwear. And that, that's one of the reasons that, you know, they, they conclude it was a triggering factor for them not being found alive because they've either fallen or they've gotten lost and have been left in the mountains. And so when we look at all of this stuff, people, um, the researchers are asking people at different times of their trip. So the top study there I talk about, it was hikers asked before they went on this trip. And then this middle studies I talk about is hikers during their hike, they've actually found these individuals and have asked them questions. Um, or, you know, sadly at the end, it's people who have died. So a lot of this is looking, who do we train? And if you have passed away, would the essentials have helped you? Or, you know, were they leading to maybe you, you not being okay and be alive long enough to be found? So there are some gaps in that research and that's where I come in. Like I come to identify if we're gonna keep on doing the research and asking if essentials are essentials, what can we do better? What can we do differently to make sure that we're properly asking the appropriate questions? And one thing is, is we can define our variables carefully. So for example, what is an adverse event? We need to be able to define adversity. Is it, um, you know, a Band-Aid, needing a Band-Aid? Is it um, twisting an ankle? Is it something that leads you to, call, to the call SAR for rescue? Is it something that, you know, stops your trip? It makes you reevaluate. We need to define when we're doing this research, looking at essentials, essentials, we need to define properly what an adverse event is. And this definition needs to, you know, the star community needs to be part of this definition when we're actually doing the research. Another question is, some of the studies look at hiking satisfaction and discussing that in terms to the essentials. So is hiking satisfaction equal to safety? Like I would they know, um, but maybe it is to some people. And so, you know, does it matter if people are satisfied if they're safe? I don't think so. Um, so what, how do we, we can ask if people are satisfied, but we also need to know if they felt prepared. We also need to know if they felt empowered to help themselves and those others on the trail who weren't prepared. And so those are the things we need to define and properly ask the questions. We need to define what the novice and experienced hiker is. A lot of this comes out of people being inexperienced, hiking trails are too difficult and being unprepared, not knowing what to do. So where is this divide? Can we use the experienced hikers to help the no, not novice hikers somehow at some point somewhere? Um, and then we also need to define the elevation of the trails we're looking at, the length of the trails and the difficulty. So the study in Switzerland that I talked about looked at, um, difficult. They, they have different colors. They have like yellow and red and orange trails. And so they look at different colors based on where these deaths occurred. Um, another study I mentioned looked at elevation. So they looked at people that need to call um, above 1800 meters and below 1800 meters. So all of these things need to be very well defined so that we understand when we ask are the essentials essentials, we need to know that we're talking about these specific environments that we're actually hiking and entering. What we also need to do is choose the correct sample. We need to choose the right people to ask. So um, a couple of the studies I talked about today were asking people prior to their trip, whether they were prepared. Some of them were asking people during their actual overnight experience, whether they're prepared. So we need to, cho by choosing the sample, we are choosing what kind of um, conclusions we can draw from the research and the data we get. So we can survey people who have completed the trip without an adverse event. But what are they going to tell you? Are they going to tell you that the stuff in their backpack was useful? I, I, maybe, yes, maybe no. I don't know. They didn't have to use it. Um, 
we can ask those who require SAR assistance to return safely home. Um, and sadly, we can also look at those who didn't return due to an adverse event. And so there is data that's looking at these individuals who have completed a trip without an adverse event. There is evidence I told you about in their studies that look at people who um, didn't return due to an adverse event. And But I, as somebody who's just started looking at this stuff, I see this whole of, we haven't looked at those who did require search and rescue assistance. How useful were those essentials to them? I bet you they were very useful. And I bet you Jay is going to have lots to tell us about this and lots of instances and a lot of um, anecdotal evidence to suggest that those people are very, very thankful that they did have something in their backpack. But there is this gap of we haven't actually accessed that sample yet. And I think talking to those individuals will give us a really good idea of how essential really are the essentials. And I bet you it's gonna be a, a highly significant, yes, they are essential. Um, and you know, about 55% of yearly calls in BC actually come from these short day trip individuals who did require search and rescue assistance. So there is a large sample there of individuals that we can access. Um, you know, maybe I'm pitching my next study here, I don't know. Um, we also have to be very clear on how far the data generalizes that you have. Every mountain is different. Every trail is different. Think, you know, Pacific Spirit Park trails that Yelena here can hike and hike, um, in quotes, and, you know, um, do, um, compared to the house out and the crest trail that has a lot of the search and rescue calls. The things I ask the people at the Pacific Spirit, what they brought, and if they brought something in, I bet you some people do consider that being in the outdoors and hiking compared to the things I ask people in the house on um, Crest, Crest Trail, what they brought are very different. The, those, those geographic differences are significantly different. I also think in BC, especially in the lower mainland, we're in this unique position as somebody who has come from you know, Ontario, who's never seen such large mountains, moving here 15 years ago, I was so surprised I could just take the city bus to get to the bottom of the crowd's grind. I could take the city bus to get to a lot of these trails. And now I'm learning, have some of the most search or rescue calls. And some of the other research I talked about looks at, you know, visitors. So looks at tourists and how often they call on people out of province or out of country and how often they are calling for search or rescue. And so when we're doing this research, we need to be very clear and very careful that we can't do research at Pacific Spirit Park and say that that applies to the house on Crest, Crest Trail. We may have to be very specific about how we define our area that we study. So are essentials essential? Yes. Um, previous work has focused on education and outreach, and I think that needs to continue. I think that definitely needs to be the key. We need to reach those 30 to 40% of people who just go out there without having a plan, without having a map, without knowing to call 911. Um, those are the individuals that need to be reached. Postmortem data from some of the studies I talked about suggest that one should carry the essentials. And that's the, you know, the hitting home point for me. If I've looked at people who were recovery calls and a lot of 80% of them didn't have the appropriate gear to spend the night on the mountain, that's a convincing factor for me. The essentials are essential. Um, we can also conduct much better research. We can ask better questions. We can ask more pointed questions to understand, you know, how essential are the essentials and specifically where they are. And we need to be extremely aware of how different the geography and the region is when we are talking about these essentials. Thank you so much. Um, for inviting me tonight. And I am um, excited to hear what Jay has to say from the practical side of things. But before then, I'm going to pass it back to Sandra. Thank you very much, Elena. That was awesome. You know, there's so much to learn. And um, I could sit here and listen to both of you each for an hour each. I know that's a fact. So it's hard to pack all this into one hour, but it gives us a chance to have conversation, answer questions, which I see a lot coming in. I answered a few myself and uh, and we'll do some live as well. Scott's doing a great job behind the scenes as well. But as we move on to our second guest and, and get through our evening, we're, we're, we're all learning along the way. I, I really do. Every single one of these, I pick up little extra tips and tricks as well. Born on the coast and raised in the Kootenays, Jay Darbyshire possesses a deep passion for exploring our shared physical and cultural landscape throughout the recreation. He's been a member of Grand Fork Search and Rescue since his departure from the Okanagan, where he was an integral part of the outdoor recreation advocacy community. In addition 
to being a search and rescue volunteer, which Jay and Scott are two of the 3,400 in British Columbia. Jay is the advocacy and fields program coordinator at the International Mountain Bike Association Canada and trail specialist for Indigenous Youth Mountain Bike Program and works with the Canadian Outdoor Medical Consulting as an event first aid attendant. His background is vast and it's in public and commercial recreation, uh, giving him a broad perspective on risk management and public safety in the mountains, especially in the context of adventure sports. Jay, I say the next time we uh, hang out, I'll bring my third child, which is my mountain bike. We need to go for a little bit of a boot, have a good ride and chat on the trails. And that sounds like fun to me, but welcome to our virtual stage. And I'm sure our audience will gain from you this evening. And uh, you're welcome to pull up your presentation, which it looks like you're doing and jump right in. Thanks. And we'll just get you to unmute there, Jay, before we continue any further, and then we'll have that pass off there. My bad. Are we good? Perfect. Okay. There we go. So as Sandra said, my name is Jay Darby. I'm a volunteer with Grand Fork Search and Rescue in the West Kootenays. I also work uh, yeah, in the event medical field and uh, in trails, and I also am a mountain operations manager at a uh, commercial cat skiing operation. So I spend a lot of time in the mountains um, working uh, in the context of like uh, employment as well as rescuing uh, people and from incidents. So I've got a broad kind of knowledge of, of why these things are important, both from the volunteer side, the personally as a recreationist, and then also professionally, um, even as I do ski patrol as well. So that's where this comes from. My main goal tonight is what I want to impart is that it, are the essentials essential? Absolutely. Um, it's really about being prepared and planning for what ifs. You know, I saw some of the questions coming in already, and I'll try and touch on them uh, through the presentation here real quickly. Um, but basically, you know, common sense and critical thinking are what's really going to, you know, save you in um, circumstances that get out of your control and help you, you know, understand what you need to take and when. Um, you know, we, we have these 10 essentials. It's a great list, you know, but you need to use common sense and critical thinking about the types of trips you're going on, how long you're going, what the weather is like, seasonality, geography, you know, the higher you go in elevation, the more the mountain weather comes into play as you're not dealing with, you know, like sub alpine weather systems, you're dealing with fast moving alpine weather systems that can come in a moment's notice, you can go from hot to rain to snow to cold in an afternoon, depending on your season. Um, it's also super situational. How many people are you going out with? How long is your trip? Is it a trail you've been on before or a trail you have never been on before? Is it in a region of the province you've never been to? You've driven all the way out to the Rockies. You're from the coast. It's your first hike in the Rockies. You're by yourself. You know, that's a different situation than I'm going to see more with a bunch of friends on a trail I hike once a week. So it's really that common sense critical thinking component is super, super important. And then putting that into the situation and in, in and understanding the geography and weather of where you're going. That's what's, you know, really the important part about the essentials, not just knowing those 10 things, but understanding how to modify them, how to, um, you know, think about how you could use those things depending on certain situations and knowing that you might need more or less of each 10 item, depending on what you're doing. So let's kind of like jump in and, and talk about some of them. So, you know, flashlights, obviously, you know, as it gets dark, we need to see in the dark as humans, we can't do that. We've got these beautiful inventions called flashlights. Um, you know, we need something that's bright enough to walk with. That doesn't mean something super big. It can be something as compact. Uh, I've got a little LED light on the bottom of my string that is, um, you know, bright enough that I can see in the dark. I might not be able to see it dusk, but when it's pitch black, it's bright enough. I can see where I'm walking my feet, uh, where I'm placing my feet, the trail I'm walking on. You know, that alone is, is enough. It, but it's also for being seen. Uh, it's often forgotten that like, you know, if I am staying out late, I don't plan on staying out late, but I go past dark. I need to be seen if I'm, even if I'm staying in place. Flashlights are great items for that. You know, headlamps versus flashlights. Uh, I believe the BC SAR documentation recommends headlamps. You know, they're nice, it frees your hands. Having a little flashlight too can be enough depending on what we're doing. 
Um, but headlamps, yeah, it lets you do more. It lets you manage situations a little bit better. LEDs, you know, flashlights have gone way, way down in price. Everything should be an LED. The batteries last longer. They're fairly bright. You know, I wouldn't be using a, a non-LED light as my emergency backup light. Um, you know, making sure they're going to they're gonna last a long time with the batteries. Having extra batteries and changing your batteries regularly. If you carry a flashlight that you use for lots of other things, I have things that go between packs into my car, into my bike bag, whatever, you know, ensuring that you're changing the batteries regularly if it is something you kind of transport between bags, which is something that I actually do. And, you know, you, I check it every now and then. Hey, does this feel as bright as it used to be? Um, fire making kit. This becomes a big kind of sticking point for some people, especially with the season we're having right now. Like, do I need to carry a fire making kit when it's a level five, you know, uh, fire hazard across the province? You know, I'm not making a fire. I don't want to burn the forest down. That's a valid point. But I think it's important to always have the essentials in our in our survival kit, in our emergency kit, regardless of the season that that way, you know, you're not taking things in and out as much. So like, it's not a big deal to throw in a big lighter, have a pack of matches and leave it in my hiking kit. So it's just always there. I don't have to remember, oh, it's fall now. It's getting cooler. I got to remember to put my fire lighting stuff back in my safety kit or back in my emergency kit. It's not just in the bottom of the backpack. I'd way rather have a big lighter and a pack of matches in the bottom of my backpack for the like $3 for the lighter and pack of matches that it's worth. Just leave it there because eventually I might need it when I'm hiking in the fall and I don't want to have to remember to put it in there. Um, fires aren't just for keeping warm. That's another thing that people need to kind of understand is like, you can utilize fires as a signaling device. You can make a very small fire. that's very safe on a rocky piece of ground, say beside a river. And if you hear a helicopter coming by, you hear searchers in the forest, you can throw a bunch of pine needles on that. It'll create a lot of smoke. Signal fires are super, super useful. So it might not just be about, you know, oh, I need a fire in the winter when it's cold. And I need to stay warm. It might need to be, you know, I'm on a trail where I'm lost. I need to be found. I might be creating a small smoking fire just to show people where I am. Um, signaling devices. I love the more the merrier. You know, most of my packs, I have a little whistle attached to them. A lot of packs now on the chest strap have a little whistle on them, being able to let searchers know where you are, being able to let other people in the region know you, you need help, you know, being able to use a whistle. Having a little mirror is, is super handy. And I love glow sticks for the price. You know, a glow stick's a great item. If you're huddled up in a shelter at night, you're trying to stay out of the elements, you're trying to like, you know, keep warm, you might not be super visible to a searcher walking by. Having, you know, a little like 99 cent, $2 glow stick that you can just hang in a tree or put on the outside of your shelter that allows us to see you and know where you are. In a pinch, your batteries die in your flashlight, you know, glow sticks, it's enough light that you can move around, say in your shelter, you're not gonna walk out with one, but it allows you at least to move about a little bit, um, especially when it's pitch black, middle of the night, it's actually a fair amount of light from a glow stick. Um, passive signaling devices are something that I think is less frequently mentioned nowadays, but you know, having a little bit of flagging tape, a little notepad, so you can, if you are still trying to move, you think you know where you're going, or you're, you're, um, you've left a spot uh, for some reason, being able to leave a note so that if we find a location where you've been, we can, um, we can know where you went or flagging tape that you can put around your shelter, around your site, high in a tree. So if I'm walking by and you're huddled up at the bottom of a tree, we can see a piece of flagging tape flapping in the wind, that kind of thing. You know, I think it's a great idea. Um, moving on. So food and water, you know, I highly recommend like, you know, even when I'm going for just short day hikes, like bring extra food. When you get low blood sugar, even if you're just an average person, your mind starts to get foggy. You start to lose concentration. You don't make appropriate decisions. It's like, you know, we need to fuel our bodies to make good choices. Um, so even if you're going on short day hikes, pack extra water, pack two granola bars, you know, whatever it is that you like to eat, eat and munch on, keep your blood sugar up, keep your energy up. Um, you know, high energy doesn't just mean sugar. Your emergency food shouldn't be a bag of gummies. You know, you want fat, protein, stuff that's going to burn for a long time. You know, granola bars, if you if you don't have a nut allergy, peanuts are great, high fat, lots of salt, keeps you drinking water, they're great. 
um, you know, fat and protein, good to get in you, you know, uh, actually like beef jerky, cheese, like stuff like that, like getting food that's going to digest over a long period of time and keep you kind of energized. Um, drink mix, salt. They give you that instant energy, but definitely you want that stuff that's going to keep you going over time. Um, water, you know, having an extra liter of water beyond what you think you need is pretty important in the temperatures we see in the summertime. If you're above 28, 30 degrees, like you can't, it's hard to stay hydrated. You want to be able to have extra water available in case you overexerted yourself or you got a little tired, you went too far, you want to have that availability. Um, you know, I'm a big proponent of carrying little water tablets that are chlorine tabs so you can cure water in the, in the woods. You know, they're relatively cheap. You get a pack of like 50, you can split them between your friends. They cut up into like tens. Usually the strips are about 10, you know, one tab will do about a liter of water. I think it's a super, super handy thing to have just in case. It's one of those really nice, just in case things. Um, extra clothing this is another one that can be kind of like a big talking point, especially in the summer and the heat, but you know, clothing isn't just to keep us warm. Sometimes it's to keep the sun away, to keep heat off us. Long sleeve shirt, if you're walking up a trail in the summer, shorts and a t-shirt, like I'm wearing pretty light clothing right now. If I was going on a day hike, I'd probably still bring a long sleeve, like just to be able to like put on a little bit more clothing. If I've been sweating a lot, I stop, it's windy. I'm going to get cold very quick. You know, we can find hypothermic or hyperthermic patients in the summertime. You can become hyperthermic well into 30, 40 degree temperatures in the right situation. So it's super important to be able to put a little bit of clothing on that sun protection hat, a bandana. Um, keep, keep the sun off you under your hat, that cool you down. Um, you know, fall, winter, spring, having those insulating layers, having a weatherproof layer, super, super important. But like I said, thinking about it in the summer too, long sleeve shirt, a hat, even if you don't like wearing them, I often just have mine dangling from my pack or dangling from my belt. I don't like wearing hats, but you know, it's been a long day in the sun to be able to put one on is it makes a big difference. Extra socks. Often people don't talk about that. Like if your feet get wet winter, fall, like having just an extra pair of socks in your bag is a magical thing. Being able to change them out prevents blisters, prevent you get keeps you way warmer, especially if you end up with a creek crossing, you didn't know where you were to go, or you step into big puddles in the spring. Like yeah, I like I always extra socks is a big one. It's a super comfort thing. Uh, keeps your spirits up. If you get wet feet, nobody's happy. Um, navigation and communication. I saw this come up a little bit in the questions, some of this stuff. So I'll try and touch on that. So there's digital navigation communication and there's analog navigation communication. Digital, that GPS, your phone, satellite communicators, you know, it's super useful. I think one of the questions was, is it enough to have a phone with digital maps and a backup battery and I'm going out and that's gonna be my navigation system and that's gonna be, if I'm in an emergency, that's what I'm gonna use. You know, it depends on the situation. Like I said, everything's contextual. If I'm going for a two day overnight hike, I would personally probably never go without some sort of paper map. You know, I run out of battery. I take too many phone pictures with my phone. I use it a whole bunch because I get kind of lost on the trail or something. My battery pack, it turns out I forgot to charge it or it's losing its lifespan. I can't get a full charge of my phone. I now have no navigation ability. I'm two days into the woods and I can't charge my phone. You know, that is why we carry paper maps. They're a backup. The other thing with digital is the digital piece people sometimes forget is it still requires knowledge. Like having a digital map, essentially most of the apps like Gaia, Avenza, whatever you're using, depending on the layer you're using, you know, satellite can be tricky to really use as navigation. Um, if you're looking at a topographic layer, you're still looking at a map. You need the same skills to look at a map you're using for navigation digitally as you do with a map and compass. I need to understand how to um, divide, um, figure out what terrain I'm standing in, what terrain I'm looking at, how the terrain is changing as I, as I travel. You know, it still requires knowledge to do that digital navigation. It's super neat that it, like there's a blue dot, I can see myself and that's where I am and I can kind of see some trails and maybe I can see a road, 
but not being able to read the terrain through whatever layer I'm looking at, whether it's top or satellite, you, you still need that knowledge component. You still need to understand what's going on. I think that sometimes gets lost as people are like, well, the phone's telling me where I am and it shows me where I need to go. You still need to know what's between you and there and how to read that. And I think it's an important thing that gets lost a little bit. And that leads into that analog component of being able to understand how to use a map and compass. And it doesn't need to be as complex as the map and compass skills that say a, a SAR person would have is, is you know, knowing how to actually plan a route, follow a bearing, read a bearing and compose a travel plan with just a topographical map and a, and a compass. Sometimes it's a matter of like having a trail map for where I'm going and just being able to figure out where North and South are so I can orient my map and understand where I am and where I need to go. Like that's simple enough in a lot of situations. And, you know, it's one of the reasons when I, I mountain bike all over the province, if there's a paper map for the mountain bike trail network, I grab it. You know, if it's, if it's free, if it's a couple bucks, the money usually goes to the bike club. I collect every physical map I can find for bike trail networks. If my phone dies. I've never ridden there before. You know, at least I can pop on a compass, make myself north. I know what trail I'm on. I can figure out where I need to go to get out quickest. Sometimes it's a matter of finding out I'm getting super tired. I kind of sprained my ankle. I need to ride out fast because it's going to be bruised and swollen in 20 minutes. Where it is it? Where am I? That kind of thing. I think it's super important to have those backups. It's about redundancy. Um, and that's that critical thinking pose piece. Like, am I going for a four day trip? Do I need some redundancy? Probably going to bring a paper map probably going to bring a compass, that type of thing. And practice, practice, practice. Even with the digital stuff, like always whipping out your map, you know, even if you're on short hikes, just getting used to being able to find where you are uh, on the map and how to navigate somewhere else. Looking at the train, looking at the satellite imagery, starting to understand how to read it or looking at the topo layer and trying to understand, you know, what the train looks I'm looking at and what does it look like on my map? Trying to understand how to read those things and getting really quick at it is super important. Um, first aid kit, everybody should at least carry the basics. Even if you have no first aid training, it, there's no reason why you shouldn't carry, you know, some latex rubber gloves, um, some antiseptics, even if it's rubbing alcohol, um, little like antiseptic pads, maybe some, uh, you know, like, a, like, a antibiotic gel, whatever, like just the basic stuff you can get at a pharmacy and some band-aids, some bandages, some gauze, like enough to clean a cut, wrap it up you know, put some stuff on it and, and you might not be doing it on yourself. That's what the gloves are for. Um, I think it's super important. It makes sense. Keeping ourselves healthy is important. Um, you don't know, maybe you get a couple of cuts, you're starting to like sweat a lot. They get gross. You don't want to do that. And then maybe you end up spending the night and you've now got an injury you didn't look after. I think it's important to look after those things. Getting some first aid training, you know, I recommend it's super beneficial to get first aid training for work, for personal recreation, just to be able to look after family members. Your basic eight hour first aid course teaches you a lot of what you need to know. You don't have to get a wilderness one. The wilderness ones are better for sure. If you're being a recreationist and you're going out into further and further places, but just understanding the basics of first aid, how to treat minor wounds, how to uh, splint an arm with a triangle bandage, super great stuff. That being said, as you progress in your training, if you get wilderness first aid training, if you get, um, you know, into the kind of more intense, like how do I treat wounds with nothing but sticks and some duct tape, you know, a lot of those wilderness first aid courses are great at teaching, um, like the practicalities of using what's on hand to apply first aid. But I don't think that's an excuse if you have that training to not carry the gear to do it the right way. You know, if you have advanced first aid training and you've made splints out of sticks and used, you know, bicycle tubes to like create a, a arm sling or whatever, that's not a reason to not carry a triangular bandage, which is what we would typically use to make an arm sling or a reason to not carry a compression bandage to close a large wound or gauze to stuff a large wound. I think it, or a SAM splint even to splint an arm. Just because I can use these cool skills and techniques I learn, I don't think that's an excuse to not carry the right gear if you have the training. I think the more training you have, the more first aid gear you should, you should bring with you and you should be prepared. Because it might not just be yourself or your uh, companions you're applying first aid to, it might be a member of the 
of the general public. And I think if you have the training, you should carry the gear, whatever that looks like. Um, that's just kind of a personal thing. Um, moving on, emergency shelter. You know, I think this is one of the big ones that people can get caught up in not bringing enough or bringing too much. You really need to think critically about what um, what you can pack and and how you uh, how much you need to bring. You know, rain, snow, cold, sun, heat. Those are our enemies. You know, the emergency reflective blankets are great all season. Blue tarps, I love. They're cheap. You get them at um, Canadian Tire or Home Hardware, a general hardware store in town. You can get pretty small ones, kind of five by eight. They fold up really nice and tiny. They go in the bottom of a backpack. You know, that's enough to help you stay out of the elements. Even if it's hot and sunny out and I'm going on a big group, you know, maybe I want some shade and there's no shade available. It's a nice reprieve. Having a little bit of cordage or thin rope, you can get like nylon coated string from hardware stores just to be able to hang it up. You know, I think emergency shelters, you don't need to go crazy, but just to be able to create some shade or keep some rain off of you, it's simple enough. It's super important. You know, you might be responding to somebody in medical distress. You can get the sun off of them. You can get the elements off of them. You're able to better look after them. You know, I think we don't know, go crazy, but it's definitely bring something, you know, at a minimum, Reflective blankets are, are awesome. They're super small. Bring two. They're so tiny. Bring two. You know, you can use them as a tarp in a pinch. Uh, pocket knives or multi-tools, you know, small and sharp. We're not doing bushcraft. We just might need to, like, uh, fix a couple things, make a small fire. Um, you know, maybe you're using it to cut some medical tape, whatever. Like, small and sharp. We don't need big. It doesn't need to, you know, don't carry an axe. You know, I usually carry like a nice pocket knife around with me or maybe a, a multi-tool. They're for first aid fires and fixing stuff. You know, that's what they're handy for. You're not, you know, creating a, you're not building an entire shelter with a pocket knife, but you might be, you know, yeah, making a little fire, doing some first aid, fixing a piece of gear. Super important to carry. Um, the other stuff, and I think this is in a good thing where BCSR has some good language around this, but like, you know, duct tape, safety pins for fixing clothing. If you get, you rip your jacket open, it starts raining, you know, you're going to get wet and cold. Being able to, to patch it up with some duct tape or safety pin it together, super great thing. I leave in the bottom a lot of my packs. The sewing kit you get, I uh, used to get at a lot of hotels. You don't see them as much anymore. I think they're a really awesome item to have. You can fix your gear, you know, keeping yourself warm keeping yourself out of the elements is super important if your gear gets wrecked in an incident so you take a tumble or you trip and fall you know you can tear the lightweight hiking jacket pretty easily i think it's nice to be able to fix something in place especially if the weather's getting bad and you're far out there um bringing medications you know having over-the-counter medications you might take kind of like pain relievers or um that kind of uh, non-prescription medication stuff for stomach ailments, not a bad idea to have, you know, it can be the, uh, the difference between being comfortable and being uncomfortable if you're there overnight, or even just during the day, you run into an instance, I keep a little pill bottle of, of the stuff I take sometimes for different things, as well as having prescription medication, you know, if you're, if you're a daily, you, if you're a daily taker of, of any medication, you should have your medication on you when you're going for a day hike, super, super important, you know, when we show up, you know, search and rescue, depending on who's coming. Sometimes we have some meds, depending on what first aid um, delivery people we have on our teams. Some of us have doctors, nurses on our teams, but quite often we're not going to be able to get you the meds you need if you're a daily intaker of medication. You know, super, super important to have an extra meds with you, um, no matter what that kind of reason you're taking daily meds is. But even on a day hike, you know, bring tomorrow's meds with you um, if they're transportable umbrellas are a good thing. I was going to put this under shelter, but like, you know, like a small umbrella, if you live in Vancouver, you probably own an umbrella. That's an okay emergency shelter or preparation for rain, you know, things like that. Thinking a little bit more outside of the box of what these items can be. Um, here's the last thing I've got is a quick kind of imagery of some like small kind of like stuff out of the top left ones out of my car stuff. I keep in a little bag in my car. The bottom left one's kind of like a day hike kit with a poncho, a mylar blanket, a couple first aid items, a glow stick, a pocket knife, a lighter, and some candles. The one on the right is typically what's in always in my bike bag. That's my hip pack for biking. You know, I got a first aid kit, a lighter, some snacks, some tabs for cleaning water if I need to, a little mylar blanket. You know, like it's not a lot of stuff, 
both these images are not quite the whole 10, like they're both missing navigation. Typically in these instances, I'd have my phone, you know, I might have a compass with me depending on how far I'm going, maybe a little map, but you know, it's not a lot of stuff. You need, depending on the situation, you can be pretty prepared without having a ton of things. And I think that that's one of the biggest reasons to carry it is like, it's not that big, you know, and it can really make the difference between, you know, uh, coming out comfortably or coming out struggling. So yeah, that's uh, all my stuff. Thank you ever so kindly, sir. Let's bring Welcome. everyone back on. We've got a lot to do. I'm just going to knock off Jay here. So many questions, so many great questions. And, and it, there were so many that we've ended up taking some of them and throwing them in the, uh, the Q&A box because we knew we just wouldn't be able to get to the, all of them at this point in time. So, but I, I wanted to start off with um, talking a bit about mapping because we had a few questions about mapping. Uh, Chris, Christina asked, whether or not it's adequate to carry a phone that has mapping apps. So if you have Trails, uh, All Trails Guru, Trails Forks, I use Oryx Maps, uh, it, have it fully charged, I got a spare battery pack, I've got charging cords and all of that stuff. If I have all that, do I really need a hard copy of the map? What's your take on that, Jay? Um, again, that's kind of, I, I tried to touch on that in my prez is, is like, it it's, contextual like am i going for a two-day hike or am i going for an afternoon hike somewhere close to an urban area where i know some of the trails already you know it it really it depends on length it depends on how many people i'm going with what my knowledge of the area is you know if i was going for an overnight hike somewhere i've never been i'd take a paper map like just that backup that redundancy is, is so important um you don't want to be relying on one thing, I think. Another quick question. Uh, bear spray was not listed in your list of essentials. It really uh, uh, it goes back to your first point about having things that are specific to the location and the, the season that you're traveling in. So uh, would you consider it something that's critical to carry and in what situation? In the spring in BC, probably 100% in most areas. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it depends on, on the, yeah, again, like it's context. It's so situational. It, it, where I live, I have bears in my trees outside my house every morning from April till July. So, and I have bear spray on my counter. <laughs> and then, you know, and how habituated they are. Most BC parks, I'd probably have bear spray. It makes a lot of sense to just carry it. Going back to the mapping side, um, we had a person who asked, <sighs> Where can they find maps? So uh, you're probably not as familiar with the lower mainland as you are with the Grand Forks area where you are hanging out, but uh, where can you actually find maps uh, for the North Shore, Squamish? I know uh, one of our um, uh, Coquitlam Search and Rescue people is actually a map maker and has made maps of Golden Years and uh, the Coquitlam area. Uh, and I, I know you can get those at say MEC. Uh, do you have uh, other uh, ideas, other parts of the province where people might be going into? Where's the best yep. place to go and find the physical map? So outside of like, you know, um, Valhalla Pure, Mountain Equipment Co-op, like your outdoor hiking stores having physical copies, my favorite way to do it is is called cal topo and we actually use it as sar topo in the star world but c-a-l-t-o-p-o.com um and you can it's fairly easy to navigate to make your own you know printable physical maps for the majority of locations the trails may not all be there but you're able to at least do a physical printed map of the terrain you're going to be in and the general region. And I think they're a really good tool for the average person to get familiarized with it and, and see how that works. And you can just print them off as, as PDFs or as like a physical paper copy. I'm gonna take a question uh, while you take a drink there. Hamad asked about uh, that he's reaching, uh, researching satellite communicators uh, and talking about how whether or not it makes sense to have an independent screen versus having a uh, personal locator beacon and stuff like that. We had an entire um, 
webinar specifically on make the right call. And I'm going to try and see if I can find it and shove it into the chat and possibly also in the answer for you, uh, Hamid, there. Uh, and what it comes down to is, yes, these various systems have pluses and minuses. Uh, and uh, we are currently in a situation where the technology is changing constantly. So right now, uh, a uh, Garmin inReach for your, the example that you have there is a is a great option. In a few years, you might actually be able to use your regular everyday cell phone in the middle of nowhere because they're looking at uh, uh, expanding that ability through some of the major uh, things, and that might be a game changer. But it's not there yet. So uh, keeping an eye on the technology, we'll put that into uh, Sandra. Just put the uh, chat in there. I'll, I'll uh, put it off for everyone, and that the the link. Look at it, what's there, but also keep an eye on the market uh, because whatever you're buying now, you're probably going to end up uh, having more options in about three or four years. So that doesn't mean you should stop and not buy anything right now. You can go ahead and buy a personal locator beacon. I personally have one. My wife has one. We have it on each pack because if I'm the person who fell down the uh, uh, the cliff, it's my wife who has to call, right? And it's, that doesn't help if it's in my backpack and I'm uh, and I'm at the bottom of a cliff. So uh, I personally use per personal locator beacons, but absolutely research it, keep an eye on it, and just be ready because technology is making big differences right now. Uh, moving on to another question. Jay, if I took all that stuff that you had in your list, and I put it in a backpack, do I need a 100 liter backpack for that? <laughs> um... So one photo and presentation that had like my waist pack and like most of the stuff I'd take biking, like that's a three liter pack. And just under half of it. Cause I actually carry like water, a jacket and all my bike tools in that little pack. So like that stuff's making, maybe taking up a liter and a half, two liters. And like, that was a very minimal amount. Like that is like the bare minimum for me going mountain biking on a trail network. I don't know, um, for a 20 K ride, let's say. Um, but yeah, that was kind of the intent of those photos. It, it, if you really look and a lot of that stuff's pretty cheap. Like I try to kind of like, uh, suss it out, but like, I'd say there's, you know, at the cheapest end, there's, 50 60 dollars worth of stuff there like between like an emergency poncho and a mylar blanket and a little flashlight like it's it's not crazy expensive and that's the like don't go big think simple small effective you know that's what you want to think about so let's talk about uh foodstuffs and drinks so obviously one of the things that you can do is you can have a um uh, you can have, like I, I carry six liters of water, right? It's for me, it's for my wife, it's for my dog. Uh, and I have no problem carrying that, but that's a lot of water. Uh, how do I make sure that I have enough of what I need and not too much weight? Uh, and what are, what's the best way of making sure like I have the most amount of calories in my food and, and I have the, 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 the best way of uh, uh, having enough water for what I need? I, I don't have one here. Um like all food in Canada is great on the back of every granola bar and every box of anything you buy has this awesome little nutritional label that says the number of calories, the number of fat, the number of sugars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you go into a save on or Safeway and there's this like rack of granola bars. You can look for like the flavor and type you like to eat, pick four different brands, flip them over, look at the nutritional information and look for like the highest fat, highest protein, highest calorie ratio in the thing you like to eat. And it's important that it's something you want to eat, not just in an emergency. Like, like you know, it's important, like I said, to stay fueled during your hike, like get something that's, that you can eat regularly. Um, if you're like me and you spend a lot of time in the woods, you go through a lot of granola bars, like I'm down to like two that are edible for me because I've eaten too much of everything. Um, but yeah, you know, find the stuff you like to eat and then figure out what's the most, you know, the highest ratio of all those things for, for you is kind of the way I'd do it. Now, we've got a person who's asking about getting courses. Now, we've put some links in the chat about uh, various places you can go. You had the Orienteering BC that you answered that question in the uh, Q&A, which is great. Um, 
But in general, first aid courses, are, we're still saying go to St. Uh, St. John Ambulance, go to uh, 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 Red Cross, go to some of the uh, wilderness first aid providers. Uh, they're all uh, really good. Do, we, do you have any specifics that you like about first aid courses or survival courses? Yep. Um, lots of colleges actually run them through the college. Like UFV does them, like the all that like Kwantlen does them. And they're usually run through the same groups that are doing them, like the Red Cross ones or the wilderness first aid courses. They're all the same delivery agencies, but a good place to like get like all the dates that are available and all the different courses is through the continuing education booklets from your local like university or college, wherever you are. And if there isn't anybody in your region delivering first aid or wilderness first aid, your local college or university is a good resource. If you go to them, they may go out and find somebody to do it and bring them into your community. Um, a through tip, a continuing yeah. education program. So if there's if there isn't any available, call your college, call the continuing education department, and they will likely be able to facilitate one happening in your community, even if you're living in a remote part of the north or the west coast of the island or something like that. Let's take. I a, know community. I know community centers do them as well. Like oh yeah, home. totally. Yeah, absolutely. So your parks and rec. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Laura asks if there's recommendation for good bear spray. I think bear spray is pretty much bear spray, but I have one recommendation, which is if you have your old bear spray, please go use it. Attempt it for the first time. Actually use it before you need it. Pull it off. You have a one that's expired or something that you're, you're going to get rid of. Take it off. Shoot it. Like Try and, try and shoot a, a, a bush. I did this just up uh, in the Coquitlam area. Uh, with my wife and it was quite amazing uh, a it doesn't go as far as you think it's going to b it uh the wind can easily pick it up and bring it back to you even just a tiniest bit of wind so uh please make sure you experiment so that you recognize what the limitations of the bear spray is because it's not a magic uh, wand <laughs> uh, i want to bring up the um I want to bring up the poll that we had because someone had a great question earlier on. We were talking about maps. So let's do that right now. So how comfortable are you navigating using a compass and paper map? So we're specifically talking about paper map, not what you find on your phone or in your GPS. Is it no problem at all? I learned this in uh, scouts and guides. I could do it completely or all the way down to, I have no idea what it would look like. What are the, these extra lines on the, on the map that have 500 and 600 and 700? See where people are on that. Oren's bragging that he's SAR trained in uh, uh, navigation, so paper maps are easy for him. OK, okay. look at that. So we've got 75% uh, uh, of the people who have uh, participated there. Let's, show, let's see if I can find the answers. That show them? I think that'll show them. That'll, that'll show them. So, what do you think about that, Sandra? Does that surprise you at all? I'm glad you put up that poll because it gives us a really good insight, kind of like what we were doing with the story today, right? You know, 29% easy peasy. So that means you've got it hands down, no problem. We know we have some SAR volunteers joining us tonight. So we we have uh, might have a bit of monopoly there. Um, I could get by 42%. You know, I like it when people are honest about this and you think you could find North. That's okay. That's good. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, great, great answers there, Scott. Thanks for pulling that up. It gives us an idea. And more than anything, what it does is it gives us a chance to have a conversation and it gives you a chance to have a conversation with yourself and maybe who you head out for these hikes and mountain bikes on with. So you can figure this out for the next time. Uh, I know this kind of springboards me and makes me think about the projections that we have through the BC Search and Rescue Association for Search and Rescue in the province of BC. They will continue to rise. We're back to pre-pandemic levels. That's 1,500 a year. But that trajectory will continue to rise and it will continue to grow at, at, a, at a rate um, that is uh, uh, a little bit to, uh, too much to think about at times, but it's, it's what will happen. That's based on a lot in the equation, uh, population growth, 
interest in outdoor recreation, social media, access to terrain, uh, that list goes on. Encouragement to spend time outside, it's healthy for the mind, the body, et cetera. So there's so much involved in that, but we know the numbers will rise. And so that takes a collective effort by all of us, including the four of us here with you tonight, to be prepared to take that time to, to learn like this so that, you know, as those calls go up, if we can reduce the severity of them, uh, as Jay mentioned, it, that's also a win. You know, if it's three hours instead of six or 12, that's success. The likes of Scott and Jay, uh, if they only have to leave their family and friends for a few hours versus a few days, that's still success, even though an incident happened. So back to your question and everybody here in the panel knows I'm great at long answers and I just proved that to you. Uh, those answers were great. And thanks for playing the poll with us here tonight. Yeah, and Yelena, uh, on the, if you had a, a single wish, uh, what one or two, let's, let's say two pieces of data that you don't have right now that you would love to have in the future. I would love those search and rescue calls that were rescues. I want to see, I want them to open up their backpacks and we can look at what's in their backpack. Um, <laughs> um, somebody take a picture, like you could just be a picture of their backpack, we'll figure it out later. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and it would be them telling us whether, you know, how they use that stuff, because that's also important, right? Um, having in your backpack and knowing how to use it are two very different things. Absolutely. Like if you, I, I always, when I do emergency preparedness stuff uh, and people say, oh, I, I've got this uh, high calorie stick of, uh, uh, of food. I said, have you eaten it? Like, are you sure that in that, when that earthquake happens, you can actually eat this stick? Because if you've, if it makes you feel sick, it's not a good stick to be uh, relying on for eating. <laughs> so you got to actually test things and make sure you know what's in there. But that first aid kit, if it's in wrapping, you're in trouble because you don't know what's in that first aid kit and what, you, what you're going to look into. So it really does make a big difference. And uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, Sandra, we've got a whole bunch of stuff to give away. We do. We have a backpack from Heli Hansen. We have uh, an awesome light from Bright Source, And everyone who's joined us this evening gets a, a free trial there for Fat Map. So that's pretty cool. So three awesome supporters for our event tonight and, uh, and some more coming on August 3rd, if you care to join us for the last webinar. Uh, but a couple of questions I wanted to ask. So we, put, we play this pretty simply about how you can win a prize. And, uh, and, and it's pretty simple on how you can do that. You can hear my sister's dog joining in in the fun. So that's, <laughs> that's always fun too. So we get you to get ready. Uh, Jay and Yelena, you're not allowed to participate, sorry. Uh, conflict of interest ever so slightly. But whoever can answer these questions first will win. So we'll start with a backpack. Actually, it's, it's a great prize from Heli Hansen. No one can say no to another. I know we all have one, another backpack. Uh, no, Scott, sorry, it's not yours, you can't, sorry. I'm sure you have more than the rest of us. But I found it quite interesting because Jay spent some time on the essentials, of course, but he talked about those additional ones, because I know everyone's heard the 10 essentials before, and that's kind of what steered us to this webinar. But we want to talk about those additional pieces too. So someone can type the three additional pieces that they carry with them that they need to take for whatever reasons. That's who's going to win this backpack. Scott's going to pick the first person who- Put it in your webinar chat them. and make sure you have all three uh, in one thing, one thing I can't read across so much. And we got one, we've got an answer from Victoria. Victoria says, umbrella, battery pack, and poncho. I'd like to mention uh, oh. that we have a whole bunch of other folks who came up with a bunch of other things like oh, safety pins, duct tape, blue tarps, heat pad, raincoat, dog boots. A blue tarp, by the way, usually does take up a lot of space. So there, there's where you might need your 100 uh, liter backpack, mm -hmm. uh, depending on how big your blue ta tarp is. Uh, Hats, socks, bug spray, hat and socks, that sort of fit in the extra clothing, but bug spray, that's a good option. Uh, a paracord, medication, battery, please bring your medications. Please, 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 it makes our life so much easier. Uh, and glasses, air pump, gloves, these are all really, really good answers. EpiPen, superb, but it's Victoria who gets the prize. Thank you, Victoria. Scott will send you, uh, send me your email and he'll communicate with you and we'll get that sent out to you right away via Ellie Hansen directly. And the last question before we thank our guests again and move on and let you enjoy the rest of your evening is for someone to win the light source from Bright Source. 
and uh, that should be good. So same idea, get your fingers ready and we'll answer this question. At the beginning, at the very onset of our session tonight, we showed a great little video and it kind of reminded you or informed you about a few things that we talk about consistently. I'd like you to list the three T's in order and the first person to do that will win the light in source. In order? The bright source. In, in order. order. And they're, they're, Come on. they're in order everywhere we go. I know there's someone out there who can do this. I, I know it. I know. It, it. Yeah, I it know looks it. like it's going to be uh, Leslie, who says trip planning, training, and take the essentials. By the way, did you notice we don't actually say 10 essentials anymore? Because as we've hinted, there's more than 10. Awesome. Thanks for playing our game. We've had fun tonight. Those are two prizes that we got to give away. And remember, everyone is receiving a trial to uh, check out FatMap. That's always fun just to see how it works and see if it's uh, going to fly for you on your next adventure. And, you know, this helps us do what we do at our work. But we're here for the Jays of the world and the Scots of the world, who, again, are just two of the 3,400 search and rescue volunteers in British Columbia that uh, hang out on 78 search and rescue groups in BC, and they respond to about 1,500 calls a year. So they're all very busy, dedicated on education as well as prevention uh, included and uh, response. So thanks everyone. We really appreciate it. Have an awesome summer. Thanks, Yelena. We really appreciate the science behind all of this and the data. I can, I can hear and feel your passion. And Jay, once again, welcome back. And we'd love to have you back again. This was uh, the second time you came <laughs> and joined you so us. Much. And always love the passion. Scott, as always, awesome, super. Take care, everybody. Enjoy Thanks, the rest Kylie. of your summer and hopefully Take see care. you on August 3rd. Bye, everybody. Bye.